Okay, let's bring it in. Let's bring it back. And uh, let's dive into the Seeking God study. So a little bit of feedback before you get into the study. Before the study, you want to share your life with them a little bit. It's not, it's not, very, it's not important that you like share with them their, your entire life story, unless that's something that's necessary. But get to know them a little bit. right? Share their life. Share your life. Um, again, you don't need to go super in the weeds in their life. There'll be time for that as you walk through the studies, but you do need enough information to understand where they're coming from and to help them feel comfortable with you teaching them. Some good things to know, and these are good just in general, is where do they live? Right? What part of town do they live? Right? Uh, what kind of upbringing did they have? Did they have a religious background? Were they close to their parents? Uh, again, we must, this isn't clinical. This isn't 40, you know, this, we're not asking them a bunch of questions. Hey, so Amani, uh, where were you born? Okay, cool. When were you born? Okay, cool. Uh, are you close to your mom and dad? Okay. Uh, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, that's weird. Uh, but it, it's, it's in the conversation. It's in the flow of conversation. And you pick up on little things, the way that they said something. Oh, well, tell me more about that. That's kind of cool. Oh, wait. Oh, wow. You're, you know, we were uh, studying about with a guy who's uh, on a boat for most of his time in the summer. And, uh, and he, he does what, what is called the milk run. There's two milk runs in Alaska. One is from Anchorage down to Seattle, but you're literally hitting almost every major airport on the way down. And then there's another milk run from Anchorage up to the North Slope. And you're literally hitting every major airport on the way up. Uh, and so he does that, but it's in a boat. So a big uh, cargo ship. And they drop a bunch of stuff off at some of these uh, villages on the uh, uh, west coast of Alaska. But it's not an interrogation, right? But he, so because he, he mentioned that, I was like, oh yeah, well, I remember when I first moved here, uh, or yeah, first moved back, I got a job as a corporate trainer, and my boss told me, hey, buy the cheapest flight to Prudhoe Bay, to Dead Horse, that you possibly can. And boy, did I buy the cheapest one, and now I know exactly why it was the cheapest one, because it went from Anchorage to Kotzebue to Nome to Point Hope to Point Lay to Dead Horse. It took me the entire day to get there. Uh, but I'm so grateful for that experience. It's like, yeah, it's beautiful, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, he got to share a few cool little jokes and stuff like that. But, but it's, again, it's not an interrogation. It's a conversation. We've got to be winsome. We've got to learn how to relate to people. Um, you know, I, I, I think I'm pretty good at it. Um, you know, as a white guy from Alaska, God hit me hard by moving to Southern California. When I became a disciple, I really learned how to deal with a lot of different cultures and a lot of different people. It was wonderful. I mean, I was culture shock. I was culture shook. I was like, whoa, there wasn't a lot of diversity up here when I, when I went to, went to school and, and I'm like, I went to SoCal and I'm just like, whoa, I remember one of my first roommates, he was from uh, he was from Thailand, but he was Thai and Lao. I'm like, where is that? It's like Laotian and, and Thai. I'm like, what? That's awesome. I didn't know any, I didn't know there were people from like Laotia. I didn't, where is that? You know what I mean? It was crazy. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of cool being able to, uh, uh, be in that melting pot of cultures. Uh, and I think it taught me a lot about how to relate to a lot of different people, ethnicities, cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds. You know, I've lived in luxury apartments, I've lived in the hood. When I moved away from my brother-in-law and sister's place in, um, um, in Spring, um, I think Spring Hill, uh, uh, just a suburb of Long Beach. I'm totally butchering that. I don't think it's Spring Hill, but anyway, uh, it was a nicer area of Long Beach. And then I moved to the hood in Long Beach with my uh, cousin, uh, where there was literally like gunshots on the corner and uh, street people of all different variations that you had to make your way through in order to, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, you know? Uh, I've studied with gangbangers. I've studied with successful real estate moguls and anything in between. But this is what God calls you and I to do as 1 Corinthians 9.22. We've got to become all things to all men, all things to all people. So be winsome. You know, again, it's not contrived. This isn't manipulation. We're not trying to market, right? This is, we, and we do this because we genuinely love them. We genuinely care about them and we get, want to get to know their lives. But don't get stuck in that and spend your entire, you know, hour long study getting to know them unless that's necessary. Sometimes people need that in order to feel comfortable and, you know, are open to scriptures. Um, and so obviously you got to, you know, kind of uh, figure it out as you go. 
Now, to set up the study, so as we do it, uh, we always have an imaginary person that we're studying the Bible with. Uh, so we need some names. Give me some names. Rodrigo. Court. Cord. Jack. Cord. Huh? Chatifer. Carl. Timmy. Okay. All right. So let's go with, uh, let's, who was the first guy you said? I, he's stuck in my brain. Rodrigo. Let's do with Rodrigo, okay? Let's do Rodrigo. Holy Spirit has settled on Rodrigo. Amen? He's sold out to the world. He needs to become a disciple of Jesus. But where, where did we meet him? We met him on campus. All right. Uh, he was, he's a business major. We met him right outside this door over here, Rasmussen Hall. We shared our faith with him. We asked him to study the Bible. What was he doing? Uh, reading reading next to the vending machine. Okay. What was he reading? War and Peace. <laughs> this guy is cultured. He was reading David Goggins. There we go. He's about to leave when we saw him and the Holy Spirit told us to go and share. We went up without any fear. We shared our faith with him. We invited him to study the Bible. And we were shocked because he looked at us and said, I've been praying for somebody to ask me to study the Bible. Yeah. See, if we would have quit one person too soon, what would have happened? His prayer would not have been answered. Or maybe it would have been answered by Mormons. Or Mother God people. Okay? We ignore the Holy Spirit just one time. We make this assumption that they might not be open, but amen, we didn't do that with Rodrigo. Amen? Uh, Romans 12, verse 11. Let's start here. Romans 12, verse 11. The Bible says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, why do I start out this way? Because if you lead a boring Bible study, you're in sin. You're in sin. Right? Let, let, let me just be very honest. Some of you, uh, like, read the Bible like it's the phone book. You can't do that. You can't read the Bible like it's a phone book. Now, we don't have to read it like it's a comic book, okay? Uh, you don't want to put like different voices and stuff like that, but, but I, I think there's a, there's a genuine uh, interest I think all of us should have in learning how to read. You might be going, wait a second, excuse me, Eric? I already know how to read. Uh, most people actually don't. Most people don't. Not that you can't decipher what the words are, but if there's a comma, like, what does that mean? It should be a pause. If there's quotes, then what you should you do? You should, in some ways, change the pace or the tone or something. You don't have to change the voice altogether, but there should be a difference in tonality when you read it. If there's a question mark, then you don't end with a low, you end on a high. Right? Or right? You see what I'm saying? There's an exclamation point. What should we be? We should be putting that exclamation point in there, right? So when we read, we want to read well, yes, so people can understand, uh, but we also want to read because it's the Word of God. The Bible says that anyone who speaks should speak as if they are speaking the very words of God. I would translate that as well to say anyone who reads should read as if they're reading the very words of God because we actually are. Amen? Amen. So when we read, we read well. When we take notes, we're actually taking notes. How do we take notes? Do we take notes based on what we think the scripture says? No. Now, the baseline of our notes should be the first principles book. Does this make sense? Yeah. Right? So, if, if you know, I, I've seen some pretty wacky notes in studies that I've done where I've led the study and somebody's just taken some really wonky notes, like it's all over the place. And I'm like, bro, just begin with what's in that first principles book because I'm going to hit those points but I'm also going to add and expand to it and I'll add a couple points here and there and da 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 da. So we also want to be paying attention not just to, okay, I've got you know, the app open and I'm going to just verbatim regurgitate what's on the app or what's in the book onto this page and, and just ignore everything that Eric says or whomever. No, 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 no. I'm going to write that down, but I'm going to pay attention to what somebody says, whoever's leading that study, because I want to make sure to hit those points that they've said. 
So we take notes based on what the person who is leading the study says, not just verbatim in the first principles book. We pay attention. We should not be multitasking. Uh, if you are leading the study, your phone should not be out. Now I get that there's some exceptions to the rule if you're like running late to another study or you know, you're this or that or the other thing, but for the most part, it should just be in your bag, in your back pocket. No phone should be on the table unless you're like using it as a, you know, you know, walking through the study series or whatever. Um, but we shouldn't be multitasking. I talked to the brothers about this last night and I said, if you're not leading the study, then what you should be doing is you should have a notebook or, a no, you know, taking notes for the person who is receiving the study, but you should also have another set of notes where you're asking questions about how the study is being led, Right? I remember that uh, when I moved to San Jose with Fernando and uh, I set up this couple of these Seeking God studies and I was fired up, you know what I mean? I'm like, all right, bro, like I'm leading this Bible talk. This is awesome. I already got two studies. The campus hasn't even got, got nothing right now. And I'm like, bam, mingles are blowing up right now. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and, I, and he called me up and said, hey, Eric, what you doing tonight? I was like, oh, I got this. I got a couple of Seeking God studies, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay, cool. When are they? Where are they? Blah, blah. So I let him know. He shows up. I'm like, okay, cool, no problem. So we sit down, and, I, and then he just, bam, starts leading the study. And after the study, we'd have a debrief. Hey, bro, like, like you, when he said this, you kind of went this angle. I would have gone this angle. What was the difference? Or, you know, what, what, what was your thought process? And sometimes he'd be like, yeah, that's a good idea. I you could have done that too. No problem. I just felt like going this way. He had no, you know, reason. Other times it was like, well, he, I remember, you know, a couple days ago when we got together, he said this, this, and this. So I'm, I'm trying to hit that and help him have a deep convictions about blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So what is it about? It's about different tools on your tool belt to help different people learn about God in the way that they need, not in the way that we've been taught or regurgitated. Does that make sense? Right? Because the first principles don't make a disciple. A disciple makes a disciple. And so we've got to understand the nuances of people's hearts and what things people need God to do in their heart, what we need to pray for, how we need to help them and come alongside them and push them and pull them and all these different things to help them have the best success at hearing God's Word. Amen? And eliminating as many barriers that Satan's going to try to throw up at us. So, um, uh, if you teach in a boring way, again, it's sin. Now, boring helping is also a sin too. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're in that study, every once in a while, the person who's leading that study might say, hey guys, what do you think? And if you're just like deer in the headlights, hey amen, bro, uh, everything's cool, you know? Well, no, have something to say. Otherwise, it's the Eric show or it's the Renee show or whatever. It is. That's dumb, right? You're there for a reason, but if you are going to share something, add something of value. Don't just re-preach the, the point that the person who's leading the study said. Does that make sense? Yeah. Your role as, a, as another person in that study is to relate to. So go back to when you did Seeking God. Go back to when you did a discipleship study. Go back to when you did these studies. And you're like, yeah, well, I remember when I, was, when, when I was confronted with this passage, I really felt X, Y, and Z. But man, I had to go pray about it because it just punched me in the face. But in the end, I'm like, no, nope, that's what the Bible says. Blah, blah, blah. Bam, I went and you made it happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, relate to it. Don't try to re-preach the point or saying exactly what the other person said, but just in your own way, okay? Make sure that what you share adds value to the study. Uh, and also, if you're not leading the study, do not give direction. You're not leading the study. You're there to help, but you're not there to give direction. Oftentimes, uh, with a baby Christian in particular, I'll say, all right, hey, to the person that I'm studying with, hey, here's the homework assignment. I want you to do blah, 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 blah. And this brother will... Yeah, and, and, and you, you should do da 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 too. And I'm like, no, bro, that's way, too, like, that's, that's way too much. You should go to the gym like every single day for like three hours. And I'm going, no, bro, like go five days a week for 30 minutes a day, hit the treadmill, that's it. You know what I mean? Like, no, you should be like crunching like a thousand times. Ugh. Like that kind of equivalency, you know what I mean? I'm like, no, bro, no, that's not, that's not what I want you to do. So if you're not leading the study, then, you know, don't give direction. Now, if you really feel strongly about that this person needs to do that or you've got this opinion or blah, 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 
after the study, talk to the person who was leading the study and go, hey, bro, hey, sis, you know, when they said this, I really felt strongly about blah, 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 blah. I, I wonder if, you know, you felt that too or you thought that too. Uh, you know, maybe that's something we can address in the next time. Oh, yeah, for sure, bro. That's yeah, totally the problem. You know what? I felt that too. And I, I, here's my game plan. I'm going to, you know, bring it up, blah, blah, blah. Does this make sense? Yeah. It's a, co it's a collaboration in that way. If you feel the person is being, person being studied with should do something, again, after the study, ask the person in charge of the study what they think, get advice, go from there. Again, just because you're invited to share doesn't mean you have to, but a good rule of thumb that I use when I'm not leading a study is to ask God if I should share. And again, it, it should add to the study and not just say something because you think you need to say it. Amen? So all that to say, that's a good way to kind of begin thinking about the Bible studies, Seeking God. So let's dive into the actual Seeking God study. And I'm going to hit these really, really quick. Uh, uh, you know, the points that are in the First Principles book are solid. Uh, so I'll just add some of my own pieces to it. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Psalm 119, 1 and 2. Psalm 119, 1 and 2. So before we dive into the study, we always pray. Amen? And so we pray, and then we hop in and we start reading. Now, uh, some people like to have them read that first scripture. Don't. We read. A disciple reads the first scripture. Typically, it's you who's leading the study. You read the first scripture. Why? Because you're setting the tone for how everybody else should read, how they should get into the scriptures. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Now, Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll just ask the person, so what do you get out of this? In fact, you'll hear me say that over and over and over and over and over again. A Bible study is not a Bible preaching. You're not preaching the studies to them. It's a Bible study. You're facilitating a, a little mini discussion about the study between them. And you're letting them do most of the talking. If you're doing most of the talking, then... It's wrong. They should be doing most of the talking. Why? Because I want them to wrestle with the scriptures. I want them to wrestle with what it means. I can tell them all day long, no problem. But they need to wrestle with what the scriptures means. And so we are going to talk about how blessed means superlatively happy. So uh, blessed are those who are blameless. I always start with, so, uh, you know, what do you get out of this? And then I, I'll use wherever they, they start as a jumping off point, And then I'll always go back to the top and work my way down. So can anybody be blameless? Typically the answer is no. Okay, well the Bible says that you're blessed when you're blameless. Does that mean like you can never, like you just forget about being blessed, forget about a good life, it's pointless? No, not at all. He's saying there actually is a way to be blameless. Well, what is it? If you walk according to the law of the Lord keep, and keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. And typically I'll share a story about my son and I were driving down the uh, 280 they're in San Francisco coming down, and there are these two reservoirs, uh, Crystal Springs Reservoir over there. And my son had probably, we had just moved to San, uh, San Mateo at the time. And my son looks at me and says, he's in the back seat, and says, Dad, what's water made out of? And if you've got kids, uh, you know that sometimes kids ask what adults are, who are like in their own world think, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard in my life. Why am I answering this question? And then you go, wait a second, he doesn't know. That's not a dumb question. Not a dumb question for a six-year-old. It's a dumb question for maybe a you know 40-year-old. But I'm like, and the Holy Spirit was kind of like, shut up, Eric. Like, stop being stupid. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm like, okay, well, water's made out of H2O. Well, what's H2O? Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen equals water. Similarly, what we see here is that two parts obedience to the scriptures and one part with all your heart equals we're blessed. We're happy. Right? Happiness is a byproduct of what? Seeking God with your whole heart. And seeking God, how do we primarily do that? We seek God through His Word, through the Scriptures. But it's got to be with all your heart. Now, some people like to add, uh, have you ever done anything with your whole heart? What does that look like? Right? And that's fine. That's totally cool. You just don't want to get stuck in the story. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, but getting them to relate to the passage is helpful. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we move on to the next one. And you just take turns reading. So I'll read first, then somebody else will read second, third, and you just kind of go around. Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. 
Let's go ahead and turn there, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how this flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of its splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow's thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And again, what's the first question that I ask? So what stands out to you? What's, what, what do you get out of this passage? We start from where they come, and then they, you know, and then we start from the top, work our way down. Now, oft, sometimes we will engage people who come up with some really weird and wonky stuff. What do we do there? It's okay for you to disagree. It's okay for you to say something like, well, like, like well, I, you know, like it's that seek first the kingdom thing. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just think that, you know, God wants us to, you know, seek the alien race. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all transplants on this planet. We're all from the, the planet to, you know, zibbity zoo and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, uh, I, 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 that's new information to me. I haven't heard that before, but let, let's, 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 let's take this from the top. Notice I'm not saying that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. What, what kind of planet are you? Oh, I, you already told me what planet you're from, loser. <laughs> No, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested, right? I'm not going to, A, A, I'm not going to like engage that at all, right? But I'm also not going to, like, like this. some people believe some really weird stuff. You know, like who knows, you know? So it's like, and nowadays with a whole bunch of conspiracy theories coming true, it's like this just opens the floodgates for crazy stuff. You know what I mean? So what's the point? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to always bring them back to the scriptures. I'm going to always bring them back. Okay, well, all right, well, that's interesting. I, 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 not, I hadn't heard that, but, well, let's, let's dive back in here. You were talking about this kingdom, right? Well, let's, let's, let's take it from the top. What is he saying about worrying? And notice I'm asking leading questions to get him back into the Word of God, back into the Scripture, get him back zeroed in on, on the passage. Oh, well, he says, don't worry. Okay, yeah, why? Why does he say not to worry? Well, he kind of talks about the birds and all that kind of stuff and how God's taking care of them. And so if God takes them and it says, You're, are you not much more valuable than they? So if God will take care of the birds and the you know, grass and everything else, but I'm more important than that, he'll take care of me way more than he'll take care of them. Yeah, absolutely. And now he's back on track. Does that make sense? Okay. So when, when we talk about worry, what is worry? What is it? I don't know. We'll, we'll look at the passage. Take a look at verse 30, the end of verse 30. It's okay for you to lead them, you know, down the, down the road. Okay? Oh, it's a lack of faith. Yeah. When we worry, it's a lack of faith. We act, when we worry, we actually don't believe that God's going to take care of us. But what should we do instead of worrying? Well, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Absolutely. That's what it says. But instead of worry, do this. What do you think it means to seek first the kingdom? Well, I guess just, you know, the things of God. Yeah. Yeah, what we're doing right here, this is you seeking first the kingdom, making this a priority in your schedule. This is awesome. What, like, being around the kingdom, right? If you think of kingdom, it's king, which is the ruler, and dom, dominion. So it's the dominion of the king. Anything and everything that's under the rule and reign of the king is the kingdom. And this thing, the kingdom of God, and so it's, Being around the people of God, it's spending time in the Word of God, it's listening to the Word of God, it's listening to His laws, the the guy who's the king, right? Yeah. What about His righteousness? I don't know. I I guess just doing the right thing. Yeah. All righteousness is is just right living. Simple as that. Now, but you'll notice, is it your righteousness? No, no, His. Yeah, it's His righteousness. Which, by the way, where do we find what God says is righteous and unrighteous? The Bible, right? 
So, again, we kind of double down on what we read in Psalm 119 about the Bible is a primary place where we can be able to put God first. Does that sound like something you're willing to do, is put the kingdom first and go after learning more about His righteousness? Yeah, absolutely. Amen. All right, cool. Let's keep going. Let's go to Acts 17. You will notice that in seeking God in word, I do not like challenge them at every passage. You're going to seek God with all your heart? Are you? No, every once in a while, I'm going to pop in there and call them to it. Now, discipleship will be different. We'll get into that in a little bit. Acts 17, look at verse 26. Acts 17, verse 26. The Bible says, and I'd like to give a little bit of a run-up to this, and I'd like to start in verse 22 uh, and give a little background as to what's going on here. Right? So here Paul, the Apostle Paul, is in Athens. And you're familiar with Athens, right? Like you took you know, Greek mythology in high school or, or you know, junior high school, so you know about like Socrates, Plato, and all, you know, all, the, all the gods of the Greeks and stuff like that. So this is that Athens that he's talking about here. And so he looks in verse 22 and he says, Paul then stood up in the meaning of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So here's what's cool is that being religious has nothing really to do with God. It has everything to do with what you worship. Right? People who worship their wives or their boyfriends or their girlfriends or their profession or money or their, uh, uh, you know, their truck or you know, whatever it is, that's their religion. That's what they worship. They are religious. Does that make sense? And he says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, meaning you don't know who you're worshiping here. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So he says, I'm going to tell you what you don't know about this unknown God. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gets all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So, what do you get out of this? Now, the way that this is worded, most people are going to be like, man, I don't even know what's going on. This is, this is a lot. Okay, well, let's start from the top. We understand, he says, God made the world and everything in it. So he says, God doesn't need us. God doesn't need a temple. He doesn't need a shrine. He doesn't need a, a, an altar. He doesn't need any of that stuff because he's not served by us. But that God, check this out. He says, he says from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. What do you think that means? Now, what am I doing when I do that? I'm giving him a little information. I'm calling out one passage. I'm pulling it up out of the text. And I'm going, okay, you can take this bite-sized chunk and give me an answer of what, what you think that is. Does that make sense? So he might not be or she might not be able to really understand the text in its full capacity. But if I give a little information and then... Have the, and then pull out this one verse that's a pivotal verse in this, this one and the next one, 26 and 27, really are the crux of the matter here in this passage. And then I'm going to allow them to wrestle with it. Does this make sense? Right? They don't need to wrestle with the whole thing, but they do, I want them to wrestle with the real point in this particular passage. Does this make sense? Okay. It's like, well, I mean, it sounds like, obviously, I think like Adam, right? Yeah, yeah, Adam. And, and from Adam, everybody else was made. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think he means by appointed the times in history and the boundaries of the lands? Yeah, man, I really, I really don't know. Have you ever wondered why you were born the year that you were born? Like sometimes I like watch medieval movies and I go, man, I wish I was born in that time. But God had me born in 1978. Why? I don't know. Why wasn't I born in the 2000s? Why wasn't I born in the 60s? Who knows? Well, God knew and God had a particular reason for why I was born, but not just when I was born. Notice he says, and the boundaries of their lands. Not just when, but where. But not just where I was born, but where I would live, where I would go, all that kind of stuff. It, don't you think it's kind of interesting that 
you and I happen to be at the mall at the same time, and you, or this is uh, here on the campus, right? Uh, we happen to be on campus at the same time. I was getting ready to leave, but God told, God's like, put a little like, you know, uh, you know sliver my brain because I saw you and I, I saw that you were reading War and Peace and I'm like, man, it takes somebody with a lot of guts to read that book. I got to go meet that guy. And so I go and, and invite you and it just so happened that you had prayed yesterday that God would send you somebody to study the Bible with you. Like, what, 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 what's the coincidence of that? What are the chances? The Bible says here there's no chances. God orchestrates everything. He determines the time set for us and the places where we should live for one reason. What was that reason? Read, read verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. Yeah. So God orchestrated all these things that you'd be at UAA, this time, this place, I would be here. This is normally not my part of the campus. Normally I'm over there with all my you know, classes and stuff. I just happen to be here and I just happen to see you and God said, reach out to you. And why? So that you would have the opportunity to sit down and do a Bible study and so God could reach out to you. Even though you might say no on the chance that you would say yes. How cool is that? Man, that's awesome. Yeah, How, that's just, it's awesome. Let's look at another passage. Let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So you don't need to spend a lot of time, guys. Right? You don't need to spend a lot of time. John chapter 4. Look here in verse 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. What do you think's going on here? You know, says what he needs to say? Yeah. You know, when, I, when, I, when you think about Christianity, and I lead this, uh, this point a little bit differently, when you think about Christianity, uh, there is a continuum of, uh, of spirit and truth, Right? And what does God say? He wants a true worshiper, which means that there are what? False worshipers, right? Which one do we want to be? Obviously the true worshiper. And so we got to make sure that we're worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. But if you look at Christianity, you see a spirit camp on one side of this continuum and a truth camp on this side of the continuum. And all of us typically came from one side or the other. I kind of came from a truth camp. They just beat you over the head with the Bible. Have you ever heard of the the, the group called the Westboro Baptist Church. A lot of people haven't heard about it these days, but uh, it's not a Baptist and it's not a church. It's a hate group. And they go out and they picket like military funerals and say, you know, murderers are going to hell. They'll go out and picket, you know, gay pride parades, you know, and they'll say, you know, uh, deleted expletive goes to hell. They'll go out and they'll, you know, you know, splatter pig's blood on girls and guys that are going into abortion clinics and stuff like that. So, so uh, they call themselves the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, that is, now, now the question that you have to ask though, okay, are they wrong biblically? Are they wrong biblically? When somebody says that somebody who's actively living a homosexual lifestyle is not going to make it to heaven, is that biblically wrong? No, that's biblically accurate. Uh, somebody who is unrepentant in getting an abortion, is that biblically wrong? Yeah, it's sin, right? Um, somebody who's actively murdering somebody <laughs> and unrepentant in that, is that sin? Yes. So they might be biblically accurate, but what are they lacking? Spirit, love, grace, decorum, like common decency. Like you might be true, you might be correct, but at the same time, you're not going about it the right way. This is why street preachers and people with signs that say, repent or you're going to go to hell, like th that does nothing. I don't know anybody in my entire life who's driven down a street with some street preacher with a sign that says, go to hell or burn, or, you know, repent or burn, or something like that, that have gone, you know what? That's right. I need to find Jesus. No. It, it's that kind of stuff that gives Christians a bad name. Right? Why? Because it lacks spirit. But 
we've swung the pendulum all the way to the other side where there we have a whole bunch of other churches that are all about spirit. They're all about, oh, I just, I just love Jesus. I just, I feel Jesus everywhere. I have this awesome bologna sandwich. I thank Jesus for it. And I just felt, I just felt all bologna, bologna love all over. It was just wonderful. And there's no truth. There's no truth. It's all about experience. And well, God told me, well, that's not biblical. I know a guy who uh, was, uh, uh, who he, he believed that God told him to divorce his wife and sleep with his secretary and then marry her. Like, I'm sorry, that's not in the Bible. That's not just weird, that's like dumb. Like, how can you justify that? Oh, well, well God just, God wants me to be happy and I just believe that it... Does this make sense? Right? So you've got this continuum. You have spirit and truth. What does he say? Both are going to hell. Both are false worshipers. He wants us to be, worship him in spirit and truth. Right? If you, you, I mean, you've, you'll get to know us a little bit. We're hardcore about doctrine. We're hardcore about knowing your Bible, if you haven't already been able to guess that. But we also come together. We're fired up to be together. We're excited to be together. We love hanging out and listening to the Word of God. And as, as, a, as the evangelist, I get to yell at them for 45 minutes about God. It is awesome. You know what I mean? About the Bible. You know what I mean? It's great. And so we need to worship the Father in spirit and in truth so we can be true worshipers. Amen? Does that make sense? All right, Acts 17, verse 10. Acts 17, verse 10. The Bible says, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Now this is another one of those places where I typically will give a little bit of background. But again, I'm going to ask the question. What's the question? What do you get out of it? What stands out to you? Well, you know, the, there was a lot of prominent people that believed. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what made them believe? Well, you have this guy, Paul and Barnabas, and, and they were, or Paul and Silas, excuse me, they were in Thessalonica, and in Thessalonica, they went to the Jewish synagogue, they started preaching the word, it was great, it was awesome, they had a great impact. But then some people from, uh, 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 from I keep forgetting where it is, I believe it's Philippi, some people from one of the other cities that they came, they came into the city, and they decided it's caught, it got such an uproar that they caused a riot. And so it got so bad, some of these new Christians were like, yo, we got to hide you guys. So they hide them, and then it's nighttime, and they send them down to Berea. And so we get a compare and contrast of the difference between the Berean Jews and the Jews in Thessalonica. What was the difference? Well, it says that they were more noble in character. Yeah, what made them more noble in character? says that they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if Paul did it's true. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, they really dug into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, we're, we're, we're called to dig into the Scriptures. We're called to spend time. But notice the, the reason why. They had a little bit of a healthy skepticism to see if what Paul said was true, Right? Now, you know, I, I would love it if you just like, you know, listen to what I said and we're like, okay, Eric's right. All right, let me keep going. No, no, no. I don't want you to do that. Why? Because number one, I want you to have your own conviction. I want you, and this is why, uh, you know, Anthony's taking notes for you so that you can take these scriptures and notes and go back and go, okay, well, I, I agree with that. I think that makes sense. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't really agree with that on that one. I got to ask Eric about this so that we can talk about it, because I want to make sure that you have your own convictions about these things. It's not just you listening to me preach or whatever, but that you and you have your own conviction about what these are. And so, I got a challenge, I got a homework assignment for you. You ready? You up for it? Yeah. Awesome. And I don't care how you, what you call it, you can call it the Berean challenge, you can call it the 3E challenge, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me, as long as you walk through these steps. And this is not in the book. 
So if the, you don't write down anything else that I say tonight, write this down. Because this is how I want you to teach them how to have a quiet time. Number one, I want you to read the book of John. Oh, I already read the book of John. Okay, how long ago was it? Oh, probably about you know six, eight months ago. Okay, cool. Now, did you just read it to read it, or did you read it and really dig into it? Oh, I just read it to read it. Okay, cool. Go back through it. Now that you got a decent overview of it, go back through it. Now I want you to eagerly examine every day. Does that make sense? Notice it doesn't say eagerly read every day. Now, if they've already been doing that, then that's fine. Read Luke. Read Mark. I, I really don't care. As long as it's one of the Gospels. Does this make sense? But why the book of John? Well, we'll talk about the book of John on Friday. Amen? We'll talk about why the book of John on Friday. So for now, I want you to read the book of John. I want you to read one chapter a day. Don't go any more than that. One chapter a day. You can go less than that if you want, if you really, really want to dig in deep. But one chapter a day. It's about 21 chapters. can get it done in like three, four weeks max. Okay? And here's what I want you to do. As you read it, I want you to get a notebook. Don't think this. Don't jot it down on your digital device. I want you to get a physical notebook and a pen or a pencil and write these down. Oh, wow, I'm kind of a digital guy. Okay, cool. Well, let, be an analog guy for a little bit, all right? And I want you to answer four questions. Four questions. Question number one is the same question we've been asking you the whole time. What do you get out of it? What stands out to you? And just jot down some bullet points. Or if you are more of a, like a real writer, journaler kind of type, just write it out. I don't care. As long as you're writing down an answer to that question, what do you get out of it? What stands out to you? Number two question. What about Jesus' character do you want to imitate? What about Jesus' character do you want to imitate? Why? Well, we're trying to be good Christians. We're trying to be followers of Jesus, right? And so if we're following Jesus, I want to imitate Jesus. Following Jesus isn't just like he's in front of me and I'm just following and I'm walking. No, I'm walking like him, right? And so, wow, I, I saw him in John 4 and the way that he talked to this woman at the well and blah, 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 blah. Man, I really want to be able to call somebody out on their sin when they're, doing, when, they're, when they're not following Scripture, but at the same time, I want to do that with very love and acceptance and, and grace and mercy, which I think is what he did, right? Yeah, so I'm going to jot that down. I'm going to jot down the answer to the question, what about Jesus' character do I want to imitate? Question number three, what do I need to start doing or stop doing in order to put that into practice? What do I need to start doing or stop doing in order to put that into practice? Now, why is that important? Because it's easy for you and I to read the Bible, think that we need to change something, and then just go about our day and never change it. Why? Oh, that, well, that's cool. That'd be kind of nice to be able to be like that or do that or say that or whatever. Okay, cool. Right on. Move on. No, Jesus actually expects us to change and to begin to put these things into practice and be like Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus. By the way, you'll notice the language that I'm using is very strategic because what are we going to get into in the Word study, especially John 8, 31, 32? following Jesus. What are we going to get into in the discipleship study? Every study, to use a golf analogy, tees up the next study. Okay? So question number three, what do we need to start doing or stop doing in order to put that into practice? Question number four simply is this. What questions do you have? What questions do you have? The NIV is written in eighth grade reading level, so it's not like it's super complicated to learn. However, we are meant to learn it in community, and there will always be things in the Bible that we just don't understand. And so we can learn from one another. So I'm going to have Anthony create a group chat so all of us can be in that group chat. And if you got any questions, then just pop it in that group chat. Let us know how your quiet time was. I'll share mine. We can share each other's. It's awesome. We can build some community that way. Does that sound awesome? Yeah. Absolutely. That's another uh, place where I'm strategically putting in some language because when we get to the word study, I'm going to talk about being in community with one another and, you know, uh, correcting, rebuking, and training one another with the Word of God, right? Okay. Sound good? You up for the challenge? Up for the homework? Uh, yeah, man, are, are you writing this? Anthony, are you writing this down? Yeah, 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 I'm writing it. Okay, Anthony's got it. No problem. We'll write it down. It, it'll be good to go. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 29 11. Jeremiah 29 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Now, some people go to 14. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, 
and will bring you back to the place in which I carried you into exile. This one's pretty simple, quick hit. God's got a plan for your life. It's a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, to give hope in a future. But in order for you to get that, what are you going to have to do? You've got to go after him with your whole heart. Right? Amen. Acts chapter 8. Let's look at a case study. I love this. Acts chapter 8. Passages we just got into, John 4, Acts 17, and, and uh, are, are seen in, actually, Acts 17, John 4, and uh, uh, are seen here in this case study of Acts 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. So it's an awesome case study of somebody who actually is putting these scriptures into practice, and we get to see what this looks like. Acts 8, verse 26. Now, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and was on his way home, sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before that shear was silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As he traveled along the road, they came to some water and said to the eunuch, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So what stands out to you here? Again, the question I ask over and over and over again. And then based on where they start, I'll start there and then work my way up from the top. Now, this one, you could add some historical context to it if you've got it, all that kind of stuff. And so basically, you got this guy, Philip, and Philip gets told by an angel to go and walk on this desert road. Now, if you've got maps in the back, it's kind of cool to kind of show them, right, where Philip was and where this eunuch was, the, the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, and you can kind of show them where that was and that kind of thing. It's kind of cool for them, especially if they have their own Bible, they can relate and kind of understand their own Bible a little bit more. But anyway, he went to a desert road. P keep that in the back of your head for a moment because that's going to come in pretty handy. He went to a desert road, but it's kind of cool, like, even with you and me, like God is trying to help you and me get closer to him. We read that in Acts 17. And now we have this case study here of the Ethiopian eunuch where he's a true worshiper. What is he doing right now? He's reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, which we understand he got his own copy of the book of Isaiah. That was expensive. But we also know he's the equivalent of the secretary of the treasury of the United States, though, for the Ethiopian government here. But it's interesting, you'll notice that he was a eunuch. Do you know what that is? Very few people ever know what a eunuch is. And once they find out, they're like, I wish I didn't know. So we walk through kind of what a eunuch is and this kind of thing. And we go, so this guy wouldn't have been able to get into the temple. He wouldn't have been able to get into the, uh, uh, the, the temple area because he was a, a Gentile convert to Judaism. Uh, and he was black and he was a eunuch. The Old Testament said that if you were mutilated in the flesh, you had no part in, uh, uh, in God. Uh, now, we'll preach on Ruth, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. It's going to be pretty cool. Uh, and why that connected with Ruth, I'll, I'll share that when we get to the book of Ruth at some point. But it's, this guy had no business being in, in, in the vicinity of the temple. But what was he about to do? And he drove a chariot almost 1,800 miles to get where he needed to go, and he was on his way back which we're talking months. And what did he do? He was a true worshiper. And what did God do? God sent somebody to help teach him the Bible. And then what happened? God provided water for him to get baptized, and he went on his way rejoicing. This is what it's all about. It's all about being a true worshiper. Amen? All right. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, uh, basically, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened for anyone who asks, receives, he who seeks, finds, to whom he knocks, the door will be opened, right? What does that mean? It's a guarantee that if you ask God, he'll open the door. You ask God, 
and he opened the door, right? And so, what do we want to do? Here's the challenge. Seek God with your whole heart. Is that something you're willing to do? Absolutely. You're going to go after the Berean challenge? Absolutely. All right, awesome. So, when are you free to get together again? Let's get together, how about in another two weeks? Uh, does that sound like seeking God with your whole heart? No, you're right, Eric. Okay. I mean, you're the one that, like, asked God to help you get right with Him and stuff like that. So, like, why don't we get together tomorrow? Oh, man, tomorrow's going to be tough. How about, how about uh, Friday? Okay, cool, Friday. How about Friday, 2 o'clock, work? Okay, cool, awesome. You'll notice that I'm suggesting when we get together. He's got to come up with a reason for not getting together. But am I going to, like, set up the next study for a week later? No. No, because that's not seeking God with all your heart. Now, am I going to, I'm going to push a little bit, but am I going to, I'll lose the battle to win the war. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. Like, if you, if you want to get together once a week, amen. All right. Why don't we get together a couple times over the next, you know, few days and have some quiet times in the morning? Right? So I want to still get together. Maybe it's not a Bible study, but maybe it's a quiet time. Right? Maybe it's, you know, just a connection point over the phone. Maybe we're going to meet together and study together. I want to keep that momentum going and have those touch points with them. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, here's your homework, guys. Homework assignment. Memorize. Here's your memory scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 11 and Matthew, Matthew 6, 33. And then I want you to memorize. You don't have to memorize the entire book of the Bible, but I want you to memorize Genesis through Judges. So the order of the books of the Bible. Genesis through Judges. And then memorize the Seeking God study. Amen? Amen. Any questions? Solid? Okay, awesome. Well, let's pray and uh, let's uh, fellowship outside.